Thank you. You may be seated. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. This is going to be a little different service. We had a great time last night worshiping the Lord and having communion and making that connection, okay, between the birth and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's good to see so many of you out. Yes. Yay. Amen. Praise God. Amen. That's a good thing. Praise God. Well, today it's all about the birth of Jesus and worshiping Jesus. Uh, the title of today's day, the day is called The Gift. And uh, so just keep that in the back of your mind as we read scriptures. We got some people who are going to be reading some uh, uh, illustrations and stories that will help kind of put all that, pull out all that together, that Jesus is the gift, not just a gift. He is the gift. And we're going to start out today in Luke uh, chapter 2, starting with verse 13. Suddenly, don't you love the suddenlies in scripture? Suddenly. A great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. Don't miss verse 19 here. But Mary treasured up all these things. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Peggy. What was seen in Bethlehem? I wonder what it would, we would have heard had we been there that night. It is a question that annually haunts me. Would I have heard the choir of angels singing? or simply the sounds of backyard animals shifting around. Would I have seen the star in the sky that night or simply two poor, very frightened kids? Would I have understood the hushed silence of the divine silence or presence, simply the, or the, simply the call of a cold east wind? Would I have understood the message of Emmanuel God with us, or would the cosmic implications of that evening have passed me by? I'm convinced that had two people been there that night in Bethlehem, it is quite possible they could have heard and seen two entirely different scenes. I believe that because of the life in this way. This is the way we see it. God never presents himself in revelation in a manner in which we are forced to believe. We are always left with an option, for that is God's way. Thus, one person can say it's a miracle, while another one will say it's a coincidence. Certainly, very few people in Palestine saw and heard and understood what took place that night. The choirs of angels singing were drowned out by the haggling and trading in the Jerusalem Bazaar. There was a bright star in the sky, but the only ones apparently saw it or paid any attention to it were pager astrologers from the east. If anyone did see Mary and Joseph on the most fearful night or fateful night, they were too preoccupied with their own problems to offer any assistance. In one of all, all in the family episodes that aired some years ago, and I'm sure most of you have heard it, Edith and Archie are attending Edith's high school class reunion. 
Edith encounters an old classmate by the name of Buck, who, unlike the other days, had now become extremely obese. Edith and Buck had a delightful conversation about the same, about the good old times and the things they did together. But remarkably, Edith doesn't seem to notice how extremely heavy Buck has become. Later, when Edith and Archie are talking, she says in her whiny voice, Archie, ain't he a beautiful person? Archie looks at her with a disgusted expression and says, You're a pip, Edith. You know that. You and I look at the same guy, and you see a beautiful person, and I see a blimp. Edith gets a puzzled expression on her face and says something unknowingly profound. Yeah, ain't it too bad? You see, what we see and what we t hear in, in life depends not upon the events, but rather on our attitude. What are we looking for as we go through our schedule? What do we allow to control our thoughts? What's the motive of our heart? Are dominated by fear, negativity, sin, and selfishness? Or are we driven by faith, hope, and love? With the greatest being, love. What are we choosing to see? Amen. Would you stand and sing with us again? Thompson was a conscientious teacher who tried to treat all her students the same. There was one boy, though, who was difficult for her even to like. His name was Teddy Stollard. Teddy didn't seem to be interested in school. He was not an attractive child. His schoolwork was horrendous, and his attitude was no better. In short, there was certainly nothing lovable about Teddy Stollard. Indeed, 
For some strange reason, Miss Thompson felt a great deal of resentment toward Teddy. She almost enjoyed giving him Fs. There was something about him that just rubbed her the wrong way. Miss Thompson knew Teddy's background. His school records indicated that in the first grade he showed some promise, but he had real problems at home. In the second grade, his mother fell seriously ill and Teddy started falling behind. In the third grade, his mother died. Teddy was tabbed a slow learner. In the fourth grade, he was far behind. His teacher noted that his father had no interest in Teddy's progress. Miss Thompson knew Teddy's situation, but still there was something about him she resented. Christmas time came and the boys and girls in Miss Thompson's room brought her some gifts. To her surprise, among those gifts was a very crudely wrapped present from Teddy. Opening it in front of the other children, she discovered a gaudy rhinestone bracelet with half the stones missing and a bottle of cheap perfume. Sensing some of the other children beginning to smirk and giggle at the simple gift, Miss Thompson had the presence of mind to put on the bracelet and open the perfume. She put some of the perfume on her wrist, which she invited the children to smell. Isn't this bracelet beautiful? She asked the children. Doesn't this perfume smell lovely? Taking their cue from the ch from her, ch um, sorry, taking their cue from her, the children responded with oohs and ahs. At the end of the school day, little Teddy came to Miss Thompson's desk and said, "Miss Thompson, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother." And her bracelet looks really pretty on you too. I'm glad you like my presents. When Teddy left, Miss Thompson got down on her knees and asked God for forgiveness for her attitude toward Teddy. To make a long story short, from that day forward, Miss Thompson became a new teacher and Teddy became a new pupil. Such, uh, both Teddy's attitude and his grades dramatically improved. Many years later, Miss Thompson received a letter from Teddy telling her that he would be graduating from high school second in his class. It was signed, Love, Teddy Stollard. Four years later, there was another letter from Teddy telling her that he was graduating from college first in his class. Four years later, there was another letter to inform her that the young fellow who had once presented her with a gaudy bracelet and half the rhinestones missing and a cheap bottle perfume was now Theodore Stollard, MD. Also, he was getting married. His father was dead now too. Would Miss Thompson be willing to sit where her mother would uh, sit for the wedding if she were alive? You are all the family I have left now, wrote Teddy. Miss Thompson sat proudly where Teddy's mother would have been seated for that wedding. That moment of sensitivity and compassion many years before had to earn her that right. Giving the gift of love. To some, it means investing time. To others, it means giving some money. To others, giving the gift of love, especially God's kind, means being sensitive and compassionate as we encourage someone to reach their potential. It's a gift that certainly keeps on giving. Amen. It's required that everybody gets up here today and shares, cries. <laughs> We're going to take up an offering right now, and this offering is a special offering. This is not going to the church. Uh, I mentioned this last week, but um, uh, this offering that we're going to be taking up now is going to go toward uh, some children in uh, Hamandishi, Africa, um, uh, an orphanage that uh, that we are familiar with through um, um, faithful. faithful. Yeah, faithful. We're, we're going to um, some of us are going to be going down to Africa come May. And, uh, and we wanted to take a gift of this uh, um, financial gift down to them that they can use. And a dollar down, down there stretches a lot farther than it does here. And, uh, and so we're investing in the lives of uh, some children down there. And it's a, it's a Christian school. And, uh, and we just are, are excited about sharing with them. So I'm going to call the ushers forward at this time. Um, if you have a, a check... Uh, just make it out to GCF Missions. Um, if you make it out just to the church, it'll get there anyway, but GCF Missions will be a more direct route. And, um, and just be as generous as you can as we invest in the lives of these children, okay? Father God, we ask your blessing upon 
upon this money, Father, this financial investment into the lives of children. We know, Father, this is more than just meeting physical needs because we know the spiritual things attached to it. So, Father, just bless the gift and the giver and bless those who receive it, Father, that, that they may feel your love coming through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll be reading from the second chapter of Matthew. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him as well. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they return to their country by another route. Joanne Long knows God's presence can be felt even in the worst of times. Buying Christmas gifts for her father had never been easy, she writes. 
He was the sort who, when he needed something, he would go out and buy it himself. On Christmas morning, he would never be excited about gifts, although he always politely thanked the giver. Last Christmas, everything changed. Her father lay in a hospital, dying a slow and painful death. When he took a turn for the worst in November, Joanne flew out to be at his bedside. For the first time since I had become an adult, Joanne recalls, he was able to show me he loved me by touching me gently. Her father had forsaken his parents' Christian beliefs. He became increasingly scornful of religion until science itself became his source of faith. Over the years, Joanne tried to share her faith with her father, but he never wanted to listen, even after he became sick. All my attempts at meaningful spiritual discussions, she wrote, appeared fruitless. Beside his hospital bed, she prayed aloud. She thanked God for loving her father and that Jesus had died so my dad might know heaven. After five days, Joanne returned home. Early in December, she spoke with him on the telephone. She told him she was praying for him. Much to her surprise, he replied, you keep doing that. This was the first time he had responded to his daughter's faith in a positive manner, and she was thrilled. She wrote her father a letter with these words, my prayer this moment is that you will take from God the gift of eternal life by receiving Jesus into your heart. Three days before Christmas, Joanne buried her father. As the family was leaving the cemetery, an elderly woman who helped care for her father called Joanne aside. The woman told her, I want you to know for sure your father was all right with God before he died. I had the joy of being able to pray with him. God had provided him with the perfect gift. Thank you, Don. Thank you for all those who've helped. Got a question for you this morning. What captivates your heart? What captivates your heart? You know, a lot of things captivate our heart. When we're, before we come to know Christ as our personal Savior, sin captivates our heart. After we become Christian, other things can captivate our heart. Sin can still do that too if we allow it to. But that question this morning is what captivates your heart? I read the scripture earlier from Luke chapter 2 where Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart, treasured them in her heart. I can't, I can't imagine in her quiet moments what she was thinking, you know, I mean, not only the announcement of the, of the birth, but then here's the actual, it actually happened, you know. I have, I'm holding God, you know, I'm holding God in my arms. And, uh, you know, he was, in, he was a, in a human body, flesh, just like any normal baby would, would uh, you know, would, would have, would be so you change the diapers you you have to nurse and all those kind of things can you imagine what mary must have been thinking you know and i'm sure she didn't understand it all i mean i'm not you know we've got the benefit of 2000 plus years of new testament scripture and all that kind of stuff she didn't have all that she had old testament she knew the law but you know this this event never happened before never happened since and it will never happen again. It's a one-time thing. And she was honored to be there. She treasured all these things in her heart. So what's, what captivates captivate your heart? The story that Peggy read about, if you were there, what would you have seen? What would you have heard? You know, that's, that's a thought I think about every Christmas. When I read a, excuse me, when I read a story, <clears throat> excuse me, I try to put myself in the place of the character that I'm reading, you know, and and the atmosphere as best as I can, you know, uh, not having been there, but kind of, you know, imagining. And then uh, I wonder what, what would have captivated my heart at that point? 
what I've noticed, you know, a star in the sky, that's hard to ignore. I mean, unless you're busy doing your own thing and you just don't ever look up. A lot of us don't look up in life. We're always looking down, looking at ourselves, you know. Uh, a lot of us, you know, a lot of people in general live their life by naval theology, you know, always looking at their navel, you know, always looking down. It's time to look up, see that star, what that star represents. It's time to look up. Maybe there's some angels that we haven't noticed before. So what would you have seen if you were in Bethlehem that night? And then we heard three letters from Teddy. And uh, she warned me she probably wouldn't make it through without crying. And uh, I warned her I'll cry along with her, which I did. But you're investing yourself. You know, what captivates your heart? Are you investing yourself in the lives of others for the, for their, for the benefit, first of all, of their personal salvation? sharing the love of Jesus, and then sharing the love of God in any way that we can. And that, you know, what captivates our heart. A lot of times our lives are lived with, with, with selfish thoughts and feelings, you know, what's in it for me? That's kind of the fleshly attitude. What's in it for me? Well, you know, God sent Jesus, and Jesus was raised, and he grew up around uh, you know, human beings as a as a as a as God in the flesh. He had a very real body, but he always lived his life for others. You know, sacrifice. We don't like that word sacrifice because sacrifice it involves pain. It involves you know crucifying ourselves over and over and over again. You know, I have to put my my myself on the back burner pretty consistently, and uh, if we do it right. And uh, it doesn't mean that that takes the joy out of life because really the joy for Jesus came as he gave his life for others. Remember that scripture, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. I can't imagine knowing that I'm going to die, that I'd have joy about that. That's crazy. It's crazy love. That's crazy love. Who for the joy, he endured the cross. Looking beyond himself. That's where the real joy in life is. When you give your life away. And then we read about Joanne Long, whose father she witnessed to over and over again, and he just wouldn't come to know Christ. He had other things that were capturing his heart. And uh, until the very end, and praise God for that home health care worker that led him to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, at the very end, he, his life was captivated. His heart was captivated by Jesus. So that brings us to today. We're, the theme for today is the gift. You know, gifts captivate our hearts, don't they? You know, a lot of times we, we get caught up, today's Christmas, you know, and some, some, some of us did Christmas Eve thing last night, and some are doing Christmas today, some are doing both. <laughs> you know, it's all, it's all good. It's all fun, and I like that. But sometimes we can get caught up in the materialistic things, and, and again, there's nothing wrong with exchanging gifts. We're going to do it later on when I get home. I walked in today, and, uh, of course, we got some family in from out of town, and uh, and I, little Anderson come in, and I looked at the tree, and we got presents all over the floor and everything. I said, my goodness, Anderson, looks like the Christmas tree threw up. <laughs> <laughs> so she came in. She's repeating that now. So we love it. It's, 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 it's enjoyable. It's, it's fun. But we got to be careful. That doesn't, you know, captivate our heart. I mean, giving to others, that should be the thing. And I know that is for most of us. But it's also important that we learn to receive. I'm not talking about greed. I'm not talking about prideful stuff, you know, where we, you know, just it's all about me, it's all about me. That's not what I'm talking about. But God wants us to receive. It is in the receiving of the, his son, Jesus Christ, that then we're enabled to give. We really don't have much to give 
until we got, have Jesus. And so that's what it's about, the gift, receiving the gift, the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ, and then learning, trying, attempting, always let it become a lifestyle of giving him to others. Giving him to others. And that leads us to the heart of everything today. Do you have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? What's captivating your heart? Can you be like Mary in the sense that you can treasure Jesus in your heart? And out of all the things you've received, that Jesus is higher and more precious to you than anything or anybody, that's including spouse, family, children, as much as we love them and, and should. But Jesus has to be at the top. And if we treasure Jesus with all of our heart, then we'll be a better husband, a better wife. We'll be a better, better uh, mom or dad. We'll be a better child to our parents. And it makes everything better if we get Jesus first. Jesus has to be first. What captivates your heart today? If you have Jesus as your personal savior, I'm still going to ask that question. What's captivating your heart? Because, you know, we still live in a fallen world and we still wrestle with this flesh. And sometimes we can get captivated with the wrong stuff, even with Jesus in our heart. And maybe today is the day where you put the priorities back into the right order. Where Jesus and Jesus alone is the greatest thing that captivates your heart out of anything or anybody else. Please stand with me. One of the things I, just, I mentioned just a minute ago was learning how to receive. We have to receive from God so we, got, we have something to give away, okay? It's hard to give away something you don't have, right? You know, I wish I could give you all a million dollars, but sorry, I don't have it. But if I had a million dollars for each and every one of you, I would certainly give it to you if God led. Anyway. <laughs> and I'm sure he would. Anyway. For the invitation today, <clears throat> excuse me, if you could take your hands and kind of put them up toward heaven like this, kind of hold them. This is a kind of a gesture of receiving, receiving from God. And I'd like to pray over us right now. And as we do, let's all join our hearts together as we pray and, and receive all that God has for us. And this gesture saying, Lord, as I re as I receive Jesus for the first time or recommit my life to you, Lord, for the hundredth time. I want you to captivate my heart. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, we come before you today and I thank you and praise you so much for Jesus Christ. As the angels shouted, and I don't know how the whole city of Bethlehem missed it, but Lord, they, they, were, they were shouting that unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior, he is Christ the Lord. And so Father, we, we receive you. If there is somebody here, Father, that has never received you, I pray that they will do it right here, right now, in the name of Jesus. That they will turn from their sin, repent, and receive you as their Lord and savior. For the rest of us, Lord, help us to be sensitive to what captivates our heart. And when things begin to get into our life and into our mind and into our heart and into our emotions, they shouldn't be there. They begin to, they begin to sh shove you out and take your place, Lord. Help us to be aware of that, be sensitive to that, and not let that happen. To keep you first and foremost out in front of us. That you and you alone would be the captivating motive of our very life. Thank you for Mary and Joseph and for their obedience as we've been preaching all month long, Lord. The visitation of the angel shared some good news with them and they obeyed. They said yes. They said yes to God. And those wise men, Lord, they were Gentiles. They, did, they weren't even Jews. Kind of strange people, actually. But yet, 
they knew something, something good was going on. And they followed that star and brought their gifts to Jesus. And we thank you, Lord. We bring our gift of love and commitment to you as you give yourself to us. Thank you, God, for that wonderful marriage of commitment to you. We dedicate ourselves to you. And thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 joy to spread around. It's so good to see you today, and uh, I want to thank all those who helped participate uh, tonight, uh, tonight, today, as well as last night, and we've had a lot of people involved with the, with the Christmas program, so thank you all for that. I just want you to know that I love you. Amen. Jesus loves you, and just spread the love around and let Jesus captivate our heart every single day. Amen? Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.